Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this research exchange talk. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm deputy director of Citrus, and we're really pleased to welcome you here this afternoon. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to offer just a couple of announcements uh, for things that you might want to flag on your calendars in the upcoming weeks. I also want to welcome our web viewers. As you know, Citrus is a multi-campus research institute, so our partner campuses are at UC Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, and we webcast all of these uh, research exchange talks live. We also archive them, and you'll be able to go back and refer to them on the Citrus YouTube channel uh, at a later date, very, very soon. A couple of upcoming events that might be of interest. On Monday, Citrus is co-sponsoring a Science at Cal event that's also part of the Bay Area Science Festival. Uh, it's called Transcending Global Conflict, How Basic Science Unifies the World. So we'll have a couple of physicists on stage to talk about some examples about how basic science research conducted by multinational teams from countries that might previously have been in conflict um, can bring them together and help to uh, create more cohesion and reconciliation. Um, so that should be a very exciting event. I'm moderating it, so please come. <laughs> we would love to have you here. Uh, another announcement of an event coming up on November 6th is the Berkeley Haas Healthcare Conference, which is actually going to happen at UCSF, um, but there are folks here from Citrus who are heavily involved in helping to plan parts of it, uh, including a panel on aging and technology. So take a look at that. Um, there will be tickets on sale soon. A uh, final announcement is about the Big Ideas at Berkeley competition. You're probably aware of this. This is one that is run by the Blum Center. Um, it's mostly for undergraduate students, and students from throughout the UC system are welcome to apply. Take a look at the different categories. One of the categories is IT for Society. So that's one that's sponsored by Citrus, uh, and we would be happy to have your participation or your, your students um, take a look and participate. I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. Ravi Prasher, who is the Division Director of Energy Storage and Distributed Resources at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Ravi joined LBNL just a few months ago in June of this year. Prior to joining the lab, he was Vice President of Product Development of SheTac Inc., a startup developing solid state thermoelectric energy converters. He earlier worked as one of the first program officers at ARPA-E, which as many of you know is a federal energy research and funding agency. Um, and there he created programs on cooling and heating of buildings and on thermal storage. So I hope we'll hear more about that this, this afternoon. Um, prior to that, he was the technology development manager of, thermal, of a thermal management group at Intel and has had a long association with Arizona State University where he's been adjunct professor and uh, graduated from there with his PhD. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Prosher. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and as you mentioned, I've been at the lab only for four months. So I hope I do a good job in representing whatever is going on at the lab. And I see a few familiar faces, so I can't really lie or, or pretend that I know everything. All right, so what, I've, you know, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, we are doing a lot of work on energy and water technologies. Water is a very big new initiative just started at the lab. And it's a cross-divisional initiative that has started. So I'll touch quite a bit about water as well. Uh, but with that, before I start, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know what, know how LBL is structured, but I still thought that it's, it's good to start with, you know, give a broad overview of uh, the Lawrence Berkeley lab. So there are five big areas, that's how the lab is divided, and, and they, all these areas have an associate lab director who report to the director. And uh, so you have biosciences, physical sciences, computing sciences, and then basic energy sciences. So these are sort of, you know, basic science related work happens there. And the V sort of, I would say, is set in the middle. We are more technology focused. So the idea is that the grand vision is that, you know, all the science which is happening, can we accelerate that, you know, the transformation of the science into uh, a technology which for societal benefits. And that's where this particular area is, is, is central to all the different science uh, or discovery science work that is going on. 
and that's the kind of uh, culture that we want to you know inculcate in the, in the, in, the, in the organization and and just a brief synopsis of the energy technology area uh, so as i said our mission is to perform uh, research and development for better energy technologies i should add water here as well uh, and the budget is roughly 120 million dollars per year uh, and and we have grand plans and and ambitions to grow it beyond 120 million dollars and we have roughly four uh, 500 uh, staff uh, and and i would say that this way right the long term vision that we have is basically lab to market to impact okay that's what we so we want to do develop technologies which can go into the market and finally be very impactful for the society and and another the way we look at ourselves is we want to become the bell labs of energy and water technologies because the you know that's what a, a lab is uh, the bell labs was great where you had a lot of multidisciplinary teams working together to solve a big problem right and that's what this lab offers in this particular area that you know people from different disciplines and backgrounds they come together to solve a big problem and and what distinguishes lbl and since i am in uc berkeley campus here i would say that proximity to ucb is one of the biggest strengths for lbl because and i will show you in most of our initiatives there is a, a one leader is from the campus one different departments okay and one leader is from the lbl and that i think is a very unique aspect about lbl and and then we also have a very strong uh, uh, division on which looks into policy and economic analysis so you have technology and policy and economic analysis happening under the same area and of course your we are in bay area that's a big big plus right the whole entrepreneurial culture of bay area helps us a lot and finally last but not the least actually uh, being in california right the cc is is a big proponent of uh, big initiatives renewable energy cleaner water and so on and so forth so that is also very very helpful for lbl okay and briefly talking about how the organization is structured this particular area so ramesh ramamurthy who is a faculty in berkeley he is the associate lab director i'm not sure if the laser okay yes and and so there are three divisions which i would say are the core which have different core competencies uh, one division is uh, is led by marian piet is on buildings technology and urban systems the the division that i am leading is on energy storage and distributed energy uh, generation and and, and conversion uh, technologies uh, this particular division is is looks more into policy and economic analysis and sustainability analysis and those kind of things and finally there are two sort of small organization one is this is should call light and that is really looking into developing technologies for the developing world or the underdeveloped world or the rural areas right and then there is a, a new organization that started a couple of years ago uh, called cyclotron road and that's almost like a, i would say a technology incubator program right really giving a chance to entrepreneurs who have great ideas to come and stay in lbl and use all the lbl facilities to convert the technology into a market viable technology or idea into a viable technology right and so going back to the vision that i said lab to market to impact i would say these two things are sort of in that line that you know your market is here and an impact sort of is here right and then we work in different uh, these divisions support those mission and and in terms of breadth of the work that goes on i mean you know it's it's it goes all the way from trl means technology readiness level right so it goes all the way from trl 1 2 to trl 5 7 right uh, we do a lot of materials research uh, a little more applied in nature but we do a lot of work and i'll talk a little bit about them we have a strong program of computational material science and computational material science and and that can be used for making different kind of materials for different applications energy and water applications uh, then then you know we have a lot of work going on 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 energy storage and devices related to energy storage and conversion uh, significant amount of work going on different aspects of buildings technology uh, then then you know so you can look at these are sort of hardware oriented right and then you also have uh, a lot of work happening on electricity distribution and controls so it's, it's more of a software architecture right uh, and then finally i would say policy and sustainability assessment very very strong component of of the lab or or the organization and and i, I don't want to walk you 
through all the list, but the, the, there are some very unique core competencies different divisions have. Uh, with the buildings group, of course, is very, very strong in anything related to buildings. And, and they do a lot of work, you know, even for the federal government and all. Uh, we, they have a lot of work happening with international programs. In my division, we, have, we are more hardware focused. Uh, as well as on the grid side, is, there's a lot of controls and software as well. And then finally, uh, on the energy analysis and environmental impacts, uh, this, these guys do you know, a lot of uh, all the way from you know, uh, environmental impact assessment to sustainability assessment of a technology or an idea. Okay, so now this is where I will really start the presentation in terms of the technical. What is the challenge that we are trying to solve and what are the, some of the initiatives that we have in the lab and how Berkeley campus is involved into those, in those initiatives, right? So what I'm showing is a Sankey diagram which probably a lot of you must, may have seen it. Uh, I've started showing now water and energy together, right? And, and there are a few key messages that I want to uh, sort of uh, give it to you here is first of all, if you look at on the energy side, uh, this is the supply side of the, of the energy Sankey diagram and this is the demand side. Uh, as if you notice here more than 80 percent is still dependent on the fuel, fossil fuel for, 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 uh, for the energy generation. right? And, and then on the other side if you look at it out of roughly 100 quarts of primary energy that we use in the US, roughly 60 quarts is wasted, 60 percent just goes as waste. Right? And only 40% is finally used in providing energy services, whether it is transportation or industrial or buildings. Right? So we have programs, broadly speaking, looking into first of all converting this into renewable. Right? The supply is more sustainable and renewable in nature. And then we also have program into looking into how do you minimize or utilize this waste, wasted heat or energy. And then significant amount of work happens on, on if just improving the energy efficiency of your uh, end use, right? And uh, as I said, there is a tight linkage between water and energy, right? That you can see right here. Almost all the thermoelectric power plants use significant amount of water for cooling, right? And there's a major concern regarding that. Uh, so, so that's 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 one area where a lot of water-related research is, is is will happen. And then also just providing clean drinking, usable water in, in, you know, for residential use and industrial is another area where tight linkage between energy and water is there, right? Uh, so, and, and that's how strategically we have planned all our initiatives or, or sort of aligned our resources uh, to broadly speaking solve some of these big uh, uh, areas. Okay, and, and this is very consistent with the goal, California goals, okay? Uh, as I said, you know, a lot of energy is still coming from fossils, so the cal we, we have taken this stance that, okay, what will it take to have 50% renewable on the grid, right? Again, it's a dream at this point, but with that dream, you have a lot of things that needs to be solved. Uh, second one is, you know, what will it take to reduce fossil fuel in transportation sector by 50%, right? And there are multiple strategies. It's not only electric cars, so there are other strategies as well. And, and finally, how do you double the efficiency of, you know, existing buildings? That's like on the, on the demand side, in improving the energy efficiency of a system itself. Okay, so now, you know, for particularly for the engineering community and the technology community, here is what I would say is the challenge, right? So sustainable energy is not in short supply. I mean, all of us know that energy used worldwide roughly 400 quads. How much solar uh, radiation falls is 6 million quads. So there is plenty of sustainable energy available. Question is how do you harness it for, for a useful purpose in a cost effective manner, right? Similarly for water, right? We use less than 1% of the total water supply. So the challenge for the technical community is affordable sustainable energy and affordable usable water. And that's where it makes it very exciting for our research and development community, right? They have a grand challenge. How do you, you know, make it affordable? So let me step back and then, and, you know, say, okay, let's go back to some of the basic science itself and then, then start probing the questions, right? I'm, I'm going to talk, I mean, all, all source of energy is related to solar except for the nuclear. And I'm just going to go back to so solar energy. So you have sun and then, 
you know, there are, it can do many things through the sunlight. So you can directly convert it to electricity using photovoltaic route. All of us are familiar with that. Uh, you can convert the sunlight into chemical or a fuel, uh, which is a photosynthetic route, right? Uh, then you can convert that sunlight into some kind of a heat or thermal energy uh, by absorbing this, this solar radiation, okay? And then finally, you have mechanical energy as well, uh, uh, whether it's wind or hydro, it's all related to solar, right? So these are the four major forms of energy, everything is related to sun. Now what makes it very interesting, what, is, what makes it useful is converting one form of energy to another form of energy. That's where cost and, and, and how you use it really becomes very, very important. So for example, you can convert thermal energy directly into electrical energy using various means. One, is a, one of them is thermoelectricity. Right. Similarly, you can convert electrical energy back into chemical fuel or chemical or a fuel into electrical using either a fuel cell or you know you can do a battery which can go back and forth between one form to another form, charge and discharge. Right. Uh, you can do the same thing from thermal to chemical. Uh, either you through combustion you can burn it, you get a lot of heat out, you can run an engine and whatnot, or you can have a thermochemical reaction and store charge and discharge. Right. And then similarly, you can have uh, conversion between uh, you know, thermal to mechanical, like an air conditioner is an example of thermal to mechanical or mechanical to thermal or heat engines. And finally, you can have uh, you know, electrical to mechanical conversion as well. That's broadly speaking, you know, now the question is how do you optimize and what gives you the best, most sustainable energy uh, uh, you know, technology and very cost effective. So what, that, what I want to highlight is that in, in LBL, we are covering a broad area in this and mostly we have a lot of activity happening here of uh, chemical to fuel, uh, chemicals to electrical. We have a lot of activity happening in chemical to thermal, uh, uh, solar to thermal. We are not really doing anything at this point here, electrical to mechanical and, 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 and you, know, you know, solar to mechanical. We really don't have any activities really going on there. Right. We might do it in the future, but at this point, a lot of this is very much covered and, and, and this encompasses all the way from good material science to system level engineering. And I'll give you now, give you a few examples of those, right. So as I said, uh, you know, impact is very, very important. Uh, and uh, so quite a few sort of startups and small companies have spun out of work done at LBL. In, in conjunction with faculty at Berkeley lab, uh, in, in the UCV campus and some of the things which has come out of, of the work that we've done in my own division is, is uh, lithium sulfur battery, a lot of people have figured it out, uh, block copolymer polymer separated from lithium metal, uh, electroactive binders, I'll talk a little bit about it, Gao Lu is sitting here who is the inventor of that technology. And, and, and you know, so that, that's the impact part is that this has really helped, you know, uh, spinning out a lot of companies. Okay, so this one, I'll start with this. Uh, Gao figured out an electroconductive polymer which is highly electrically conducting. Uh, so, you know, if you have uh, silicon nanoparticles at, as, an, uh, as an electrode, uh, so if you, you know, either you have percolating networks, they'll connect each other and then, but the electrical conduction is not very, very good. So what Gao figured out is a binder, is a polymer binder, which is electrically very, very conducting. And the polymer binds to the silicon using so, some kind of covalent bond. So the binding is also very, very strong, right? And that won an R&D 100 award, which is very, very prestigious. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is the kind of work which, which, you know, which in, includes both material science as well as process engineering and device physics. And, and uh, let me go to the next one. So that was more or less, I'm just going to give you a snapshot of different uh, research activities happening uh, in, in LBL. So that was more on the side of, you know, uh, uh, materials work and the device work. But what you also need, right, I mean, when you do materials work, uh, you know, the, what is the difference between, if you go from material and the performance is great at the material level, right, when you put in a device, this is consistent across any technology. Once you put in a device, the, any material will come in contact with another material. So interface is always a big challenge whenever you make a device, right? And every time an ideal performance, anything from an ideal goes to non-ideal because of mostly because of interfaces. So understanding interfaces is very, very important. So in particular in batteries, for example, you have an electrode, uh, then an, uh, 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 you have electrolyte, then a cathode. 
So the interface between the electrolyte and the different anodes is very, very important. That really degrades the performance of a battery compared to an ideal scenario quite a bit. So understanding those interfaces, so diagnostics become very, very important. So one, one is called uh, uh, the SEI, SEI layer and where you basically you're trying to, you know, between the cathode and the, or the electrode and the electrolyte, there is a layer which we really degrades a lot of performance. So uh, Robert Kostecki is a scientist who developed techniques to really look at this interface. What is going on? What is the physics taking place? And how, once you know that, then what can you do to prevent that? Right? That's more on the diagnostic side. All right. So that was more for the battery side. Uh, we, as I said, we have a lot of work happening on, uh, on fuel cells as well. Uh, that's more uh, on electrochemical generation. So, you know, uh, I think I have not seen the video yet, but just somebody, somebody just sent it to me. Toyota just launched the, the hydrogen vehicle. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they, were, they had announced it, but apparently they just launched it today. Uh, and that's where this is based on, 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 on fuel cell, uh, hydrogen based fuel cell. So we have a lot of work going on understanding all the way from what happens in the membrane in a fuel cell to the whole fuel cell device and the whole system and we team up, we have teamed up significantly with, with advanced light source which is a synchrotron in, in LBL to really look at those techniques to understand the physics of in the real world device, right, what's going on and this is one example of where Adam Weber who runs this group looked into uh, 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 the membrane and seeing what how, what happens to these membranes, how do these ions and stuff transport in these membranes, right? So this is again an uh, 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 an example of where a lot of cross disciplinary work is going on. Okay, and I mentioned earlier that uh, we do a lot of material science work, uh, and 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 we are actually with uh, probably some of you at least from the material science are familiar that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work going on. Uh, you can do a lot of computational design of materials, right? Using first principle calculations on a computer. I mean, that's a dream. And there's a whole materials genome initiative that started by uh, by the White House like three, four years ago. This whole idea that you can churn out a lot of difference in materials composition on a on a computer, and then you can have very fast synthesis of those materials and rapid uh, synthesis of materials can you know lead to some unique properties in a shorter duration of time. So we have a group which, which looks into first principle calculations and, and, and then they are combining with a lot of data mining techniques, right? So really taking a lot of data from different sources available, combining the first principles with this data mining technique and the idea is that with that maybe you can actually design a material and then synthesize it for different applications such like thermoelectrics, photovoltaics, solid lighting, so on and so forth, right? And, and so that is a very strong part of the group uh, and that's, that I would say is more on the applied material side. Okay, and, and then we also have, you know, as I said, we have a group looking into combustion and, and converting chemical to uh, thermal energy uh, and, and so I would say that uh, one of the that we work that we are doing is actually developing a biofuel screening facility. So, you know, there's a lot of these uh, the biofuels when you design those biofuels and, and, and make the synthesize those biofuels. Uh, one of the challenges is that when you actually put it in a real system, what happens? Do they really perform according to what you expected? So, so there's, that requires, you know, a lot of mechanical engineering as well. Uh, so we have a, a work going on, a research going on on a very rapid synthesis of different formulations of biofuel that you can really test in an actual system and see which one really uh, lives up to its promise in the real world. And so that's that's the work going on in in the in the combustion lab. Uh, uh, they have developed a burner technology which has been used uh, selected to uh, you know look into the commercialization aspect of the technology. And and finally we have internally funded uh, uh, a program on reciprocating engine development. So you know if you have combustion, so what? Finally you have to convert that that energy into something more useful. And, and so engines is the way to do it, right? And so there's some work going on there as well. Okay, so that was more on the, I, I said, uh, on the, you know, hardware side or the component side, the kind of work that we are doing at LBL. Let me switch gears a little bit. So now, you know, these are some of the core competencies that we have and then we have strategically identified few big initiatives, right? Or, or reprioritize few things. And so one of them is, what is the next generation grid? At least the approach or the vision that we have is that 
at least 50% renewable in a distributed fashion is attached to the grid. Okay. And then that's what makes it very interesting and challenging that there are a lot of research questions that you have to answer. So, you know, if you look at the future, right, uh, you can look in a very integrated manner that, okay, you have uh, solar is one source, uh, wind is another renewable source, right? Uh, solar energy, uh, maybe some of you are familiar, there are two ways you can convert it into electricity. One is through photovoltaics. Another one is, you know, they shine a lot of this, they collect the light and then reflect it by a mirror on liquid and they heat up the liquid and that runs a turbine, okay? And, and so the idea, the grand vision is that, okay, what if you have a, just like an electrical bus, you have a high temperature thermal bus, so you convert into heat and you can store that energy and you run an engine or a turbine or, or maybe you can just convert it directly into electricity, right? And, and, and again, a, you will still need some kind of a fossil fuel, maybe it is a biofuel or a fossil fuel which, which will be powering an engine or a fuel cell. Uh, then you have heating requirements which again depends on fossil fuel or biofuel and, and then you can have a, a medium temperature thermal bus just like electrical bus, different high voltage, low voltage, medium voltage uh, and a low temperature thermal bus for you know cooling, right? Uh, because there is always a mismatch between supply and demand of energy, right? That is why you need storage. Similarly, you need electrical storage. So, you know, there are different components, but if you look at this integrated holistic architecture, right? That actually, if you look at it, you will find out that you can have enormous amount of energy savings because you are tapping into a lot of wastage and converting into useful form of energy, right? However, this is not simple. I mean, they, first of all, you have component level challenges, which I sort of alluded a little bit in earlier, and then you have to look at the whole system. It's, it's, it's a system architecture. It's like you have to define the whole operating system for this whole architecture to work smoothly, right? So one of the biggest challenges, I would say, if you integrate significant amount of renewable energy on the grid, and I think it's, you know, it's pretty obvious, is that the, grid, the, the renewables have a lot of variability, right? This is a snapshot of a PV output and, and you can see during the day there is a cloud cover and stuff and then output dramatically fluctuates, right? Uh, so that makes it very, very challenging that how do you, you know, first of all your demand fluctuates, you know, there is prediction in terms of lights switching on and off, people have different ways, different lifestyles and whatnot. That itself is variable. Now your supply is also variable. So that's, that's a, how do you manage that supply and demand with this variability? So one of the grand challenges is that if you plot on uh, uh, the cost of energy, so photovoltaic, it has dramatically come down, very low cost. However, it has no dispatchability. You don't have any control over the energy coming out of a photovoltaic cell when you want to dispatch it. That's what a fossil fuel you can do. Fossil, with fossil fuel you can dispatch it at demand, right? So if you put batteries today, the cost of PV plus storage, let's say put lithium and battery, is will be 2 to 3x, okay? So totally unaffordable, right? Uh, so the challenge, and people have looked into this concentrated solar power plant, is only because they can put storage. That's the main reason that they can, they are still, there's a lot of interest. So, so this concentrated solar power plant where you're basically heating a liquid, is still uh, much more affordable because of storage. You can see these two tanks, it's a plant in Spain which can store equivalent of 350 megawatt hour of electricity, right? So grand challenge for the community is how do you get here, right? And so that you can beat natural gas and coal. Because natural gas and coal are batteries. They are storing the energy in that coal or natural gas. It's less like a battery. If you can get that, that's a game changer, right? And then that's not easy. I mean, it's in plus, you know, you have significant life cycle require, cycling requirement and it has to survive more than 20 years and so on and so forth on the grid, right? So we have one, one project that was funded by RPIE uh, uh, looking into, uh, you know, a flow battery. So particularly for the grid, you don't have to worry too much about energy density. I mean, you, you can have a larger system as long as it is cost effective and reliable. Uh, so in a flow battery system, you basically have two tanks where you have different, you know, uh, the chemicals and, and then you have a membrane and, and then you use these two tanks, uh, they sum as, as the cathode and the anode, uh, so to speak. Uh, to store the energy, right? I will uh, skip that. Uh, one thing as I mentioned earlier, it's not only about hardware, right? It is also about controls and information, particularly when you go to the grid and you start distributing things, right? 
So if you look at, at a very higher level, you took a 50,000 foot view, what is the big challenge? So you have different time scales. Uh, at the device level, you have, say you have an inverter, battery, uh, HVAC, all those things that they, at the device level, the time constants are anywhere from microseconds to, uh, to a minute. Uh, okay, then, then you have a na natural time constants, cloud covers or diurnal variation, there is no sunlight in the evening. So that goes from minutes, minutes to hours, right? Then you have market waste time constants. So today people do something called demand response, which basically means that suddenly there is a significant demand then the, you will switch off the air conditioner for a while, for five minutes or so, right? So to save cost to the consumer, right? That, there's a market forces behind it. That, or you can actually think about integrating electrical vehicles and providing the battery on the electric car as a resource to the grid itself to provide a storage. That's also so that, and the idea is that you can make money of that, at that asset. So that's a market-based time consistency of roughly between hours to days, right? And then planning of whole infrastructure, months to years, right? So the grand challenge is, hey, you have, is there a smart controller which can control information and energy very seamlessly between different uh, uh, time scales, right? And that will require both hardware as well as a lot of software and control strategies. All right, so we have a sort of a project going on again with the Berkeley campus on uh, uh, micro synchrophaser. Uh, sorry. Uh, where they are trying to do, do a lot of measurements on the actual grid. Actually, the, the, mes the measurements are happening in the LVL grid. And, and the idea is once you collect this information, uh, can you uh, uh, really st start optimizing for power flow and systems control and so on and so forth. So this is, this is a project which was funded by RPE. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. Uh, you know, I, I have already talked about quite a few things. Let me just touch upon... Uh, the energy water goal. Uh, so again, uh, the challenge is that what we want to do is, I mean, it, the, the water initiative at the lab is much broader than what I'm showing you here. This is just for the division that, or, or the, uh, for our area, is to reduce the cost of desalinated water by 5x. And let me show you why. First of all, you know, you go back to 1962. Uh, President Kennedy was already talking about desalinated water from, uh, from the ocean. That, that will be, if somebody can figure out a cost effective way of doing it, that's a real game changer for the whole society. Okay, so we have an energy water uh, initiative, which is the whole lab wide initiative, not only in the energy technology area, because it just goes beyond desalinated water. There are much bigger, larger issues. Uh, it relates to climate change as well. So there are different different uh, aspects of this initiative. I will touch upon this one, which is in desalination, we are looking into, you know, are there new thermodynamic cycles which will reduce the cost of desalination, uh, the energy cost of desalination. Uh, and that is where, you know, we are interacting a lot with the basic, uh, uh, the chemical sciences division because this will require new materials, new chemistries, right? And new in, and in systems engineering, innovative, uh, systems approach. So that, that is where, again, it goes back, the strength of the LBL is that you can do a lot of uh, team science and, and we are reaching out to our colleagues in, in particular in the chemical sciences division um, and also in the material sciences division, uh, looking at new types of membranes, new types of chemistries, okay? Uh, then, then there's a lot of other work happening on water efficient technologies. Can you just increase the efficiency of the water use itself, okay? And the water conservation, uh, there are a lot of uh, modeling and analysis, bioengineering, uh, you know, can you have salt tolerant plants? Uh, but I will just give you one snapshot of, 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 of our problem statement for this particular one, is the desalination. So if you look at desalination, uh, today the seawater desalination is uh, costs you roughly $1,000 to $2,500 acre foot. Uh, I think the foot is meeting, miss, missing here, which is basically volume, right? And, and in Southern California, from, from the metropolitan or municipal water that you get, that's roughly $500 per acre foot. Roughly, you have so 4x, okay, 4 to 5x, right? That is a challenge. And that's, as I would say, roughly at this point, the cost is almost one third, one third, one third. I mean, in a, within plus minus 10 percent. One third is the energy cost, one third is the maintenance cost, and one third is the capital cost. 
Okay, and you cannot just say look at only one aspect and ignore everything else. Then you are never going to get there. Okay, so that is the approach that we have taken. That okay, we got to look into energy cost. That means maybe new membranes, new chemistries, and so on and so forth. We look into uh, the maintenance as well because maybe figuring out membranes or something which can last for 20 years in the field, so that you don't have to change it. And then innovative, very innovative systems engineering. Maybe co-locating a plant next to something else where you can tap into maybe waste heat from a power plant. Right. All these things has to will play a big role in reducing the cost by 5x. Otherwise, you, should, you can't just get it by tackling only one aspect of the problem. And also in terms of technology, as you can see, depending on what the salt concentration is, some technology makes sense in some particular regime, some technology makes sense in some other regime. Right. So, so those are the strategies we are still formulating, and that. You know, we have a work going on capacitive deionization, which is electrodialysis, and the reverse osmosis work is, you know, there's a lot of work has already happened. Question is, are there something else, right? And that's, that is an initiative which this will require collaboration all across the board from uh, material science, uh, chemistry to engineering. And, and I think again, I'm going to skip this. There's a lot of partnership happening with the uh, uh, with the campus, actually, we just got awarded a big 40 million dollar center called China Ener uh, Energy Research Center. It's called CERC Wet. Uh, Berkeley campus is leading it. Ashok Gardgil is going to lead that whole center. He has a joint appointment with with the campus, and he's with us in LBL in the uh, energy technology area. Another great example of where campus and LBL is very heavily involved. Okay, I'm, I'm you know, quickly rush through some of the slides. Uh, I think the time is running out. Uh, so one thing I'll talk about is the transportation. Same thing, the goal is you know, reduce fossil fuel consumption of 50%. And here the strategy is to look at both technology and system science. And I'll give you examples of technology example I already gave you. I talked about batteries, I talked about combustion technology, right? So I just give you some examples. I'll give you a couple of very good work has come out of on the system science, right? And then I'll also talk about some work which has happened on understanding sustainability of a technology, right? And, and the whole idea again is, you know, there are different metrics of success, uh, miles per megajoule of energy or travelers per megajoule of energy. There are many ways to look into whether you, are, you have a sustainable transformation infrastructure or not, or a strategy or not, right? Okay, so one of them, I mean, Sam is sitting here, he was one of the co-authors in this paper. This is more of a systems approach. That let's say you have the driverless car technology available to you today, right? We have figured out all the rules and regulations and, and Department of Motor Vehicles has, has started issuing licenses and all those things are taken care of, right? So now, you know, can it lead to some significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? So Sam and his colleague, they did a very good study uh, recently published in Nature Climate Change where they looked at driverless taxis right I mean then in that case maybe you don't even need to own a car right I mean they, you know and and they did a lot of analysis and they found out a significant maybe 90 percent or more reduction in greenhouse gas emissions just because it just increases the number of travelers per megajoule of energy we are doing a lot of car sharing and then traffic light and so you don't have to stop the cars and stuff like that because it will be very very automated you don't need really in an ideal case you don't need a red light everything is very coordinated so this is a great approach this is an idea of system science you're not really looking at new technology it's just a very system level approach enabled by a new technology right that's one another one is it's a pretty cool application again sam is very instrumental in this is uh, something called the my green car so today when you buy a car you go and say uh, you are you know honda crv for example uh, which is a fossil, but even same thing for electric car, and they'll tell you 30 miles per gallon, or Nissan Leaf, 100 miles is your range, right? But that's in a very specific test conditions decided by EPA, right? But all of us have, have very different driving habits and different driving terrain, right? I mean, I take Grizzly Peak. I mean, I, I know that when my car is showing so many gallons, as soon as I hit the, the, the you know, the mountains, immediately, dramatically drops, uh, you know? So the idea is, what these guys are doing is that, they will make the mileage specific to your driving pattern, okay? And that's pretty cool. I mean, you have well-calibrated models for different components, different cars, right? And say you're going to buy a car, you, you, you drive your car for seven days, and this app is just basically recording your driving pattern and everything, sends it to the server. It has all the very well-calibrated models for different cars, 
and then spits out the hey for your driving pattern this will be the range for an electric car or this will be mileage for a gasoline car right and then so again very good sort of i would say in a, in a way system science itself right and 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 i and another one as, as i said we have a big group looking to sustainability and policy right this is an example of of Corin Scoin Scoin she is a researcher there in the policy group she looked into uh, you know did some very good analysis with with the bioscience institute on understanding of a, a sustainability uh, analysis of a biofuel refinery okay so there as you can see this is a biofuel refinery they looked at every component and what not and what strategy you should follow so that you can minimize the greenhouse gas emissions right uh, so this is again this requires this is sort of an example of uh, you know system engineering as well as combining with some policy aspects right uh, there's that particular uh, division also looks into uh, uh, you know uh, environmental impacts with you know with Volkswagen uh, diesel a controversy that we just you know uh, we know of it has become these kind of studies become even more important right now there is a study going on again with with berkeley campus they are trying to figure out uh, emissions from a uh, diesel trucks right and and they're doing a lot of studies actually on highways a lot of measurements are going on and then a lot of data analysis and that influences a lot of policies this is this is a science which will eventually make uh, uh, you know uh, impact on policies how much time i have i, I don't know who is keeping track of time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Is there is anything for question? I mean, okay. All right. So maybe I'll just very quickly I'll touch upon this and then 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 stop for, to take some questions. Same thing. I, again, on buildings, uh, the initiative that we have is to uh, reduce energy consumption in buildings by fifty percent. And the way it is evolving now is that if you look at, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so LBL is, has a great history in buildings technology, right? I and mean, they have developed some of the first two 1970s when this whole division started or area started started build understanding energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, they have developed some great tools to simulate buildings, different components of buildings, whether it's windows, HVACs, lighting, whatnot. But the way it is evolving now is that we are trying to understand what happens if you look, start understanding interaction between different buildings, okay? Would that lead to some significant energy savings, right? Thus, one plus one is equal to two in terms of energy, or one plus one is equal to one point five because you can tap into something which is being wasted in one in one building as useful in something else, right? Uh, for example, uh, cooling and heating of buildings, right? I mean, you can do a district heating and cooling, right? Which basically means you have centralized location where cooling and heating is happening. And you're just cooling everything together. And the one example that came to mind is somebody was told me recently that Stanford, some campus or a building, they just implemented a brand new district heating and cooling system. And it's very interesting, right? When you're cooling something, you're rejecting a lot of heat through the condenser, right? But you know, in a, in, in a campus like this, you always have some use for cooling and heating at the same time. So what they're doing is that when they're cooling a part of the building or whatever, that condenser heat is actually not been thrown to the ambient. They're using it to wherever the heating is required. So that's an idea of, you know, we're looking at building as a collection of buildings, not just individuals, right? So that makes a big difference. So that's how these things are evolving. And because of that, you know, uh, the modeling and all the other things will become more complex. Your planning has to play a very, very big role into it. And, and that is the part of this initiative, the buildings, uh, the urban infrastructure, I think it's called uh, I don't, uh, urban systems initiative. So now, not just looking at building as individual building, but looking at the whole urban system. Okay, so and I, I, one thing which we have started is uh, something called a Global Partnership Alliance. I should, as, as it goes back to um, the original mission that we have, is lab to market to impact, right? Traditionally, it has been very challenging to sell energy efficiency projects, right? There's much more money when you have renewable generation uh, ideas, so venture capitalists to private sector put much more money behind that versus uh, if you have energy efficiency ideas. And so we have figured out ways to sort of monetize on that. And this alliance is bringing a lot of private sector players together. And the, the strategy that we have in mind to monetize an energy efficiency is that what if you provide somebody with a guaranteed performance, energy performance of building for next 20 years, 
Okay, so say in this building you do a lot of upgrades, LED lighting, very good HVAC system, smart controls, and so forth, and then somebody wants to buy it, you go and tell them for 20 years you guarantee that this is the performance that you'll get, energy performance. But that's not an easy problem because this will require a lot of modeling, a lot of fidelity in your models and stuff like that, right? Uh, and then use patterns, how people are using it, how different components are behaving. But, you know, that's the whole idea. That a lot of knowledge has evolved in different, different fields. We are trying to combine all these things together so that maybe, you know, you can start providing a very guaranteed performance. And that you can monetize. Too. Once you do a guarantee, you say you stand behind it, people will pay for it, right? I think I'm just going to, we have a, I think I'm just going to stop here. Uh, maybe just five minutes or so. I do actually. Um, sir, it was a very interesting talk. Thanks so much. Um, you talked about guaranteed performance so that the end user would have money get back in their pocket. How is the utility going to be com compensated for managing this sort of technology? The utility has a lot of um, you know, fingers in this pie. How do you see that working? Yeah, ma'am, so this, 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 I think it goes back to your question on this, right? I mean, this one, the Global Partnership Alliance. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, I can cut, connect you with the person who's leading this initiative. They will be able, to, Rahul is a, is a person, and he can give you more details. But as far as I know from him, uh, you know, they are talking to a lot of utilities as well. So utilities are going to be part of this initiative itself. So get, be inclusive. You can include them from, from day one, right? Uh, and and that's, that's, that, that is the strategy that, that, that we have adopted. Do we have other questions? Yes. yes. Um, you mentioned Bell Labs. I worked at Bell Labs long ago. And in Bell Labs, they had a basic research area and an applied research area. And the basic area, they were concerned with publishing papers and winning, winning Nobel Prizes. And the applied area, they were dealing with dealing with problems that the people in the factories were dealing with. So, how do you see applying something like that to LBL? Well, I would say, you know, LBL is, is, is uh, LBL has 13 Nobel areas too, right, which have come out of LBL. I think the idea is that how do you, the way it is evolving now is that how do you accelerate the science into more of a technology, right? And I would say that we are right in the middle in terms of, you know, really interacting significantly with the basic side. So, so, the, so, so for example, let's say water is an example, right? You know, there are certain chemistry, we don't know the chemistry. I mean, I, I, we can go back and say, hey, if you do this, do you have some chemistry which can do these things, right? And so I would say it will be a lot interfacing with the basic sciences guy uh, to, you know, solve some of these problems. But going back to the Nobel Prize, I'll tell you this, I presented it somewhere. I said, for our area, the Nobel Prize is, you know, Jack Kilby, I, I used to work for Intel. Uh, Jack Kilby got a Nobel Prize for integrated circuits, right? And if you check his bio. He has hardly published any papers. He has only patents, okay? So because he really engineered a very, very tough, tough problem. And, and Robert Noyce, who was a co-founder of Intel, he, he died, so he didn't share it. So I would say, for this particular area, the Nobel Prize he is in solving a very tough, practical problem, which might require a lot of, you know, inputs from the sciences. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's what I mean, you know, in terms of... Uh, I would say when I said the Bell Labs, it was more about team science rather than just individuals working towards one particular thing. Any other questions? Okay, well please join me in thanking Ravi for a great talk.